thanks so much for joining me today here at Port City Personalities. I have a great show planned for you. Super excited. I'm going to be joined with Eric Payne and Eric and I will be talking about a lot of different topics and then once him and I are finished I will be joined by Matt Kean, and we'll be talking about his comedy and what he's been up to. So let's get started with you, Eric. Eric, how are you today? I am outstanding. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming by and joining me today. I do appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me over. Eric, you and I have known each other for, I think, how many years? I want to say. Just about 10, I think. About 10 years. So we first met when um, I think I was putting on a charity event and I called you up and you so graciously offered to come by and you said, I'm not sure how you need any help, but I'm here for anything, anytime to help support the community. Has that always been your mantra? Yeah, that's where, um, you know, grew up in small town PEI and, and that's, that's where we lived. Um, it, it's not necessarily about the bigger picture, but we got to make our own corner of the globe, we'll say tolerable. Sure, absolutely. And so for anybody that's watching right now, who are you and what do you do? Uh, I was in the military for 23 years. Um, I got myself into a little bit of a, of a motor vehicle crash uh, back in 2005. I became an amputee okay. at that point. I was fortunate enough to be a part of some of the new programs that were coming out for veterans out of the Canadian Forces uh, with the Soldier On program. Um, so I relearned how to do an awful lot of sports which I had been interested in before. Uh, I was with the public service. I left there to take a job uh, in media with radio TV journalism over at NSCC. Um, came over here, worked as brand ambassador for a couple of radio stations. And uh, as of late, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm working in a pro shop at the uh, Cuplex. Perfect, so you've always maintained your employment and I wanted to talk to you about a couple of different things so I think you have a phenomenal story about what you've overcome and we're gonna really take a deep dive into that but first I want to talk a little bit about comedy so you do comedy as well I've always tried <coughs> to make uh, what's around me tolerable for everybody um, the ability to come out with something that eases everybody else's stress or strain, uh, kind of refocus. It was always an ability that I had, especially with the military. Um, and, you know, as long as you can make people laugh, you can engage them, so, which kind of gives them the sense that you get what they're going through and vice versa. So as I said, a little joke here and there, keep things light, uh, and it was a good, uh, good mantra. Now, realizing my skill set in this, um, once again, uh, I was in a crash in 2005. So let's talk about that then. Let's okay. Let, let's, and I know this is hard for you to talk about, but I think it's important to, for anybody that's watching that, like you said, is trying to overcome something or going through it. But um, <coughs> so the day of the crash, this was 2007. Let's talk about that. You were driving them. 2005. Like, okay. Um, I had recently returned from a deployment. Um, up north, uh, I had a motorcycle. I was coming up on what they call the 20 year mark, which means I could retire uh, with a pension from the military. Wanted to make sure the mil the mil uh, sorry, wanted to make sure that the motorcycle was all done up and just in case I decided to, to leave. And I had that done while I was up north and I picked up my motorcycle on the 15th of April 2005 and then on Tuesday night <laughs> which was I believe 18th or 19th uh, I was out with my my friend and his wife uh, he was the senior instructor of the motorcycle safety course where we were close to the Kentville hospital and there was a Dodge truck out of the lane okay and we're at the hospital no or? no three kilometers away uh, uh, near Kentville okay now geographically the hospitals at three kilometers, RCMP, fire, and EMS are at three and a half. Um, so after the crash and when they got called, I heard them turn their sirens on to come up the road, really. Right. Now, um, I did have a passenger. He sustained, uh, actually, sorry, 
My passenger was 11 years old. Um, and when I figured out that I wasn't getting out of the truck's way, I tried to fling him off the motorcycle because to me he weighed about as much as a bag of chips. I got him to here and then we made impact. Um, once again, he sustained 43 breaks in his leg. He's got a plate in his hip now, but he's also a crane operator in Halifax. He, he's doing well. Um, also, when I grabbed his hand, I grabbed his his right hand, but when we went, ended up going in the air, we both broke our right thumb. So now there's a little joke between the two of us. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> and he returned. So um, I had been a bit of a first responder with the military. As soon as uh, I got orientated to where I was, you know, I'm laying there on the ground. So did you know something was serious at the time or did oh, yeah. you go into shock? When, well, and as were I you said, laying I, on the ground? I was laying on the ground. Um, I, the truck made contact, the front bumper hit my engine and my left knee was somewhere in between. Um, but as I said, I took off in the air and I kind of did a flop over onto the pavement. And uh, I heard signs from my, my passenger. He was conscious, he was breathing. His mother was with him. She was ex-military. Um, no, she was military at the time. So she was taking care of him. So, okay, he's, he's taken care of. I started doing my own body survey to see that, you know, are my arms okay, my wrists, my shoulders, my back. You were assessing yourself while laying there. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you're laying there and you think, what is your mind? So you're laying there, you say, shoot, something's really wrong. My hands, my, like, what, yeah. what is that well, like, Eric? And, and that's, it, it, it's kind of a common phenomenon that, you know, you want to know that you're okay. Um, they'll teach you in first aid, to look for somebody who's walking away from the scene of an accident, because usually that's somebody trying to self-assess to try and figure out whether they're okay or not. And I figured out that I was okay from the waist up. I had all these new modifications done to my, my bike, uh, noise, <laughs> paint, shiny bits, all that kind of stuff. Brand new leather jacket on. Um, Helmet, of course. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I had Everything. all the gear, but yep. nothing was gonna stop what really okay. happened. Um, once I figured out I was okay from the waist up, then I said, okay, it's time to look down. And I looked down and things weren't right. <laughs> right. Uh, so what did you see, if you don't mind my asking? And I not know at all. Hard to talk no, about. actually it's, it's not. Okay. The sting has been out of this for years. Uh, my boot, the bottom of my boot was beside my, my right hip. Sorry, my left hip. Oh left leg, God. left boot, left hip. Um, so I said to myself, self, you're not moving anytime soon. So as I said, I just, somebody came over and, and uh, propped up my head and did the fire truck and the ambulance showed up. Then it was off to the hospital and then off to the QE2 um, where I stayed for seven weeks. They were gonna pin me from my hip to my ankle. Um, not really cool on all that, um, but not knowing what to do about it. Um, because the way things work is that if I make a decision, I could be held responsible for it, and that could have impacts on the future, whether it's job, whether it's insurance. You're all thinking all of this at that time. No, no, not at that time, but you know, you pick up on this stuff pretty quick because it comes at you really fast. You're just like... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, in the, the first week, they had me on morphine, which wasn't a good drug for me. I had a lot of paranoid delusions. But once they finally got me off of that, um, my mother was over from PEI, and uh, I was laying in a room by myself, and I had, once again, the leg was still attached, and it was braced out, and I'm, I'm in a room at the Kiwi 2 by myself, and my mom comes in, and she says, you're not paralyzed. And I go, no. And she goes, you don't have a brain injury. I said, well, I was lucky enough they didn't test me before I got in here, so no. <laughs> she goes, your leg's a bit chewed up. I said, yeah, it is. 
she goes. Both of them there? No, just the one. Okay. She goes, uh, but they're going to fix that. And I said, I hope so. Okay. She goes, so we didn't know anything at this point? Well, we knew the, the, to... the leg was chewed up. Okay. Um, we didn't know that it was going to end up being amputated six months later. Okay, but, so talk me through this process. But that was the, the thing with my mother. She said, you need to know that you're okay. Good words. Yeah. Great words. Um, you needed to hear it. Yeah. Also, as I said, it, it's got so much applicability to everything else. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what's going on. You need to know that you're okay. Mm -hmm. You need to keep on moving forward. So Great words. The, I went through 14 operations. I was in the hospital for seven weeks. They sent me home to convalesce before they did the operation uh, to did pin you know me. It, to pin you? Pin me. And what's that mean? they were going to take a steel rod and fix it to my hip and fix it to my ankle as best as I could figure. Okay. Um, so uh, what they didn't tell me is when they took blood work for the operation that I had slightly elevated uh, infection levels. Which Does that impact anything, Eric? It, it impacted everything. So three weeks later, uh, I'm finally back into the hospital and I have an E. coli and staph infection that's just about 12 hours away from death. Um, so they, they, they did what they needed to do. They cleaned me up um, and I had to go up for one more operation. I got there on a Thursday. They took me back up to the OR on Monday and on, on the Tuesday my doctor came in and I'm dealing with a uh, Dr. Coles who's a uh, trauma uh, orthopedic surgeon at the Kiwi 2 and he says okay here's your options and by this time I'm done uh, as far as the leg goes I said take it off and he goes no no no. I have to tell you this <laughs> if you don't know orthopedic surgeons use recept saws and hammers whatever they're going to tell you is not going to be pretty so he went through a process where they were going to move a, a bone or two around and there was going to be halos involved and I said so how long is that supposed to take he goes about two years I said so two more years worth of operations and two more years worth of post-op infection how many surgeries are we talking over two years roughly right well I, I didn't ask that question but I said what do you recommend and he, oh. and he said amputation and I said good now we're on the same page and then I said damn and he goes what and I said, where are you taking it off at? Because I kind of think that's a, an important question in this. I agree. And he says, about two inches above your knee. I said, okay. Um, I already started seeing other military guys coming back from Afghanistan, the Americans, mind you, but they had prosthetics that they could run with and they had prosthetics that they were jumping out of aircraft. So you had friends and stuff, like in folks well, that you knew? Well, I didn't knew? know Did them. you know anybody that had prosthetics before you at, that you could refer to? At that to? point, no. Right. Um, that must have been really scary and really challenging. Well, it was challenging because, like, even I, I'm, I'm a big guy with, with, with information. Right. And I'm trying to find information online. Prosthetic leg, prosthetic leg. And I'm coming up with really nothing. And then somebody said, you have to Google prosthetic knee. That's oh. one component. Oh, then yeah. the foot, then the, uh, the socket where your uh, residual limb goes into. Right. So then I got some information and uh, still with the forces, I might add. Um, and, and once again, mum pops up. Oh, what a great mama. And uh, she says, what do they do with it when they take it off? Right. This isn't, this isn't going anywhere. I hope this isn't somewhere near machine well, or something. Well, and, and that was the thing. I said, yep. you know, I said, um, I don't know where you're going with this. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not exactly, you know, on an even keel most days either, but yeah. th this is even a little bit much for, you, for me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, sure. she, she says, if you want, and uh, I said, okay. She says, I'll take it home, have it cremated. I, I've got a, a yeah. sibling who passed away in 96 in a car crash. And she says, I'll put it in your, your sister's grave. 
And I, I said, Mom, we come from a town that's less than 500 people, and the last thing I want them to say is, look, there goes the pains. You know, the brother who threw the leg over his sister in the grave. Right. Yeah, it just felt, <laughs> but for her, she was trying yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, she was being, you know, how. Um, so as yeah. I said, I got her the answer that she really wanted, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically, you said, uh, what is removed is taken over to Dow. They do some stuff with it then they uh, they dispose of it in some However manner. However they see fit. Yeah, and I yeah. said, Mom, I'm, I'm factually done with this. If I'm supposed to have it on a, another celestial plane, I guess I'll run into it there. If not, I guess not. Right. Um, but I have to get up off my back and get going. So. And how long had you been immobile at this point? Six months. Six months. Yeah. And just, and that was predominantly spent in the hospital, Eric, and then home until the infection started? There, there was a mix. Um, it was 10 months uh, before I got back to the workplace okay. again. Yep. Um, but uh, the six weeks, uh, that took me to the end of May. Okay. Uh, back in the hospital, late September, amputation happened roughly mid-October, and then I went to the rehab in Nova Scotia to do rehab to get ready for prosthetics at the end of November. The end of November, okay. So, and, and so I took that time before Christmas. I took a month after Christmas, uh, and by this time, I, I now have a prosthetic leg that I can use. How long was that process? Was it, do you meet the person that's going to make it for you? And what's that for anybody that doesn't well, know? Well, and as I said, in Canada, the process is you require a, uh, a pre uh, prescription okay. from a doctor that says you require a, uh, a prosthetic leg. You need a prescription for that. Yeah, yeah. You can't just make a look and you need to have an actual, yeah, yeah. well, Be a specialist to recommend like what's needed and stuff. The, uh, the doctor who's in charge of that is called a physiatrist. Mm, okay. And, That's where I was going with that. And uh, they give it to a... Um, I almost said prosthetic, like a prosthetist. Okay. They're the people that make the the prosthetics themselves. Right. So there's measurements done with your residual limb, yeah. how far it goes. Sure. They also take into consideration what is your life like. Yeah, your Are, lifestyle would pay, pay like. Now, what about cost-wise? So when they're making this, is it a budget thing? Is this something that's covered through Medicare? What is this? This is a secondary. Um, device so meaning? The, meaning it's not the I think the initial one is covered uh, for Nova Scotia underneath the MSI uh, program what does that mean for anybody that's so watching? that that's your provincial health insurance over Nova Scotia okay. and remember this is 2005 yeah, this is, yeah, yeah this is a bit ago, this is almost 20 years ago. yeah um, there's been some changes of course there has but I'm talking this time for you so but Assisted devices in the Maritimes, in general, are taken or paid through your secondary health insurance, so your work insurance, right? If you've got Blue Cross or Manual Life or Sun Life, they're usually taken up through those. If you can't afford that, they have a disability support system that you have to go through that your income and, and all these different factors that go into your ability to pay for a device. Okay. That may not make or match your activity level. Yeah, that's where my mind was. So what happens when you're put in that kind of delicate situation, Eric? You have to make it work. That that's the simple thing. You see this all the time where you have somebody who's newly become disabled. There's a local fundraiser whether it's at the Legion or yeah, Community I've Hall. Yeah, stuff like that, of course. These are the gaps that are there for people with disabilities. This makes it harder for you to get employed because you don't have all the capability. To be able to do the job. That, exactly. So like for, for, your, for you, for instance, to have your other leg, to be able to be mobile. Exactly. Without requiring a chair or something, sure. Well, and, and I do have a chair. Yep. See, that's, that's the, I'll say the beauty of my situation. But let's say I was doing clerical work 
and I required a chair, a wheelchair that stood me up. Okay. But my finance end of it, when it goes through disability support programs, okay. doesn't cover that. So is it a close then coverage? I have, is then there I, a big gap? Ever? There can be. So these devices, are, can they be very costly, like for a Well, limb? your average wheelchair right now, and this is not the powered ones, the ones with the little toggles on them, just your average push chair yes. is $5,000. Holy smoke. Uh, I am in the process of getting a new prosthetic leg right now. Yeah, uh, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. So how long have you had this prosthetic leg right now? Uh, the one that I have on, yes. a week. You just had this one a week, so yeah. this is your new one, okay. This, this is a trial on a new type of leg Ooh. Um, for me. Okay. This leg has been around for roughly about 10 years. Okay. So um, this has safety features uh, to help me catch myself if I go to fall. No way. Yeah, well, it will lock up where the other one will just collapse. Wow. Um, I'm getting older and hitting the floor is starting to hurt. Yeah, yeah. even <laughs> younger folks, sure, anytime. So, so. Um, well, and, and uh, I used to make uh, light of the situation with a, a friend of mine who's in wrestling, mm -hmm. uh, Cowboy Mike Hughes, hi Mike. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I told him, I said, come on, I can teach you how to fall now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, You always have such a lighthearted humor. Well, too. and as I said, there, there's, I no, there's no sense of being angry about it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can do about this. Am I an amputee? Yes. Can I do anything to stop that? No. <laughs> that's fair. That, so why be angry about it? That, that's a lot, a lot of wasted energy. Um, and, and once again, I've had the ability to be able to laugh, mm -hmm. and I've seen other people who don't. What's that like for you? So, do you find that? Uh, do you find that? So, I consider you a positive person. I know you have days and have challenges. We all do, right? Yeah. Even, yeah. But do you find that you're having these kind of conversations with folks that are becoming, uh, that are new amputees, or perhaps are going to become one? And do you find? you know, the mood and stuff, are you able to, can you give a specific situation where you thought sharing your story helped somebody else? Well, the, it, everybody wants to hear, especially when they feel alone, because I'll say especially, but there's all kinds of different situations where people feel isolated yes. and alone. Yep. And to be able to put your hand out and say, you're not alone, come you're in a group, you're in a club, you're in a, it doesn't matter if it's a car club, a 12 step program, uh, another amputee. I, I helped start uh, the Canadian uh, Coalition of Amputees in Canada. What is that, Eric? It is a program where amputees can get a hold of the organization and they will match you by sex, by level of amputation, um, in your area if possible, and they will reach out to you and, and basically have a conversation. They'll answer any questions that you have. That's amazing. Just to, because amputees are one half of 1% of the population. Wow. Disability covers 20 to 22% of the population, so there's a lot more of us in general, but it's like welcoming you into your 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 new normal, your new family. Um, yes, these are challenges, but these are not just yours. And when you get together with other people who have the similar challenges, that's where the answers come from. Sure. You know, I'm having problems getting my license. Hey, I tried this. Oh, yeah. Um, I, you know, my work isn't as accessible. You can refer them to this organization. They may have some uh, governmental uh, uh, dollars to be able to help that business make it more accessible for you. But if you're just thinking, oh, you know, my boss isn't going to do anything. They're not going to put a door. Me. Yeah, yeah, accommodate yeah, me. I'm going to end course. up losing my work and sure. I'm going to have to go on disability. Financially, mentally, emotionally, all the. All the things. Sure. You know, and, and 
I'll say more so for men. Okay. Uh, it's it's about uh, where is my worth? Where is my worth? Or do you remember, Eric, our very first conversation that you and I had when we'd met? Um, the very first thing you said to me when we were getting prepared for the show, he said, is there anything that you can't do or anything I wanted to know for stage? And you <laughs> said, I focus on what I can do. And I thought, what a great attitude. And you smiled and you walked away and you said, and then after the show, I remember us talking and then you said that that was the secret to like your attitude, which is... Well, and, and that's... You know, there's always been things I couldn't do, and that was long before disability. Yeah. I wasn't the most coordinated human being on the planet, so I fell before. I'll guarantee you, nobody cared when I had two legs. Right. Now that I have one leg, everybody cares. I get a crowd just about every time. Because um, you're real, and that's what it's well, all no, about. No, I don't even think it's, it's so that. So you're fake? No. Uh, <laughs> it's parts of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's... But what is it? Seriously, all kidding aside. Well, the, it, it is focusing on what I can do. Um, and I understand when other people see me, especially when they don't know what the story is, how this happened. They see a guy, possibly in shorts, because I do wear them a lot. You do, yeah, that's your thing. Um, and you can see the prosthetic leg. And I can see their nonverbal cues. I, I know how girls look now. Mm -hmm. They just do it from farther away. Mm -hmm. um, but they're trying to come up with a scenario, if that was me, would I be okay? Could I do the same things? Could You're I- You're reading all this from the you, people. Yeah, I can do it from, from their nonverbals. And if it, their, their face gets really screwed up, usually that's when I'll intervene. Um, and what, like, what do you mean? What will you do? Give me an example. Uh, Hey, eyes up here. Yeah. It starts the conversation or hi. It, it, it's something very simple, um, but that silence is the fear that if it happened to them, because everybody, you could be a slip, a fall, getting hit in the, the thigh with a baseball. These are simple things that cause amputation, let alone full on disability. Sure. Um, we don't know what's around the corner. We don't. And I try and say, you know, it's a challenge, but you can do it. But your mind has to let you. What do you mean by that? Uh, there is an example of a, of a gentleman that I know. He was young. Um, he was a baloney amputee. He couldn't get his head wrapped around it. He really just, he couldn't. Uh, and he went into a major depression and the end result was suicide. Um, it, yeah, it, these are some of the realities of my life. If I take a negative tact on it, um, these are some of the places that I can end up. You know, everything becomes a challenge. Every person becomes a challenge. And it's, it's like you're waiting in in muck up to your waist and you just get tired yeah. um you know i, I don't um, i have an awful lot of sympathy for the individual because it's it's more about wanting the pain to stop and not necessarily ending your life however um, i try and keep myself in a place where that is not an option i'm not saying i'm successful at it all the time no but, every day's every day's a new day right but once again, as I said, these are realities if I don't keep uh, my focus where it needs to be. And this is another part of getting involved in the community. Um, I'll, some veterans get dogs, some get service animals. Um, I at one point had a dog. Unfortunately, he's passed since. I'm sorry, Eric. Yeah, so am I. Um, but it's, it's getting yourself outside of yourself because I know my head is not the place for me to sit and think. That's uh, fair. Um, it's, I need somebody else to take my hand to go in there because I come up with some really not creative solutions. Sure. Um, but over in Prince Edward Island for 10 years I, I was managing the uh, Paris hockey um, program that was going on over there. I 
was given an opportunity in 2009 to set up a team and we did so and since then it has flourished in the in the Maritimes uh, with teams in Cape Breton, Bridgewater, Halifax, um, Prince Edward Island, Moncton, Dieppe, Fredericton and I've Goodness. started up here in St. John at the Qplex. Um, we'll be looking for people in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, <laughs> if you have there. a disability or not, mm -hmm. um, I don't care. You want to come out and learn how to play this sport? I don't like putting para beside things. No. This is just a sport. Male, female, young, old, whatever. Want to come out and play this sport? Come on out. Uh, we have equipment. I've got my own, um, but there is equipment there available sure. to get a team together so we can, I'll say, join up in the Maritime League, uh -huh. and there'll be room for a junior team, which means under 18, and a senior team, which is 18 and above. Um, the program has produced one player that has gone on to the national team. Wow. Jacob LeBlanc from Moncton. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, incredible player, glad he's there. I, I'm so happy that I was able to be a part of, I'll say, his story as he moved through and, and now is, is 20 and playing with the national team. Um, I would like to see more of that because sure. when they've done studies more so with wheelchair basketball where you have people who don't have disabilities playing with people who do, there's more of an awareness. Like there's, we don't sit in the dressing room and say, oh my, I'm, I'm an amputee. It does look like a kind of a toy box with broken toys because there's arms and chairs. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, why did you miss that shot, you tool, you know? Yeah, all that's <laughs> happening still. Yeah, all the regular bands. Yeah. 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 Um, competitiveness and funness that's human nature but people don't understand a good that time. Um, I did get asked at one point from somebody um, what does it feel like to be disabled and, and I, how I, did you respond? I, I I told him I said I'm not big on the spectrums with feelings to begin with yes okay can you describe to me this disabled yes I don't feel Segment, uh, segmented. Uh, I feel whole. My soul feels whole. So I don't get the how do I feel disabled? Does that mean I, I, I feel like um, I, I'm not a part of or I'm excluded from or, you know, that's a different feeling altogether. But I don't have that problem either. Um, if if I want to participate, I'll, I'll go. Um, there there are a couple of sports that I wouldn't mind playing with those who do not uh, typically play with this disabilities. Ball might be one of them. Slow pitch. Sure. I haven't tried that one yet, but it, as I said, that could be coming. Okay. Um, but I'm more accomplished now than I ever was before the amputation. I'm now a qualified open water diver, um, paddy diver. Um, I can three track ski. I run para ice hockey programs. Um, there's really nothing that I have wanted to do that I haven't done. There, there's nothing to stop me from going in a certain direction whether it was leaving the public service to try and get a job in media or, or maintain a job in media. Do uh, you want to play sports? What sport do you want to play? Um, I have been fortunate enough to be flown by the Canadian government down to the Annapolis Naval Academy to play para ice hockey against wounded warriors and then drop the puck at the outdoor Washington Toronto game. I know an awful lot of people who don't have disabilities that don't get these chances. So when people tell me, oh, you're disabled, I said, I, I don't know what you mean because my life is way better. <laughs> this, this, the stuff that has happened to me since 
was not on the table sure. prior to this. Absolutely, and Eric, uh, thanks so much for coming. And before we go, um, thanks for sharing your story, but anybody that's watching right now that could know somebody that's recently become an amputee or that is an amputee at home that's feeling alone or going through the process of getting a prosthetic limb, what do you have to say for them about your, if you're to compare it with your own personal journey? You're not alone. Um, you can get a hold of the uh, coalition, the Canadian Coalition for Amputees online. You, you can uh, Google that, they'll come up with a number and you can contact them. You can contact me, Google my name, Eric Payne. Stuff will come up, I've got my own website as well. There's contact information there. Um, your life doesn't have to change. It may adjust, but it doesn't have to change. Um, and, and as I said, there, there, there is people who will help you and they may be able to get you to some of the resources that you need. Eric, thank you so much for sharing your story. I love you so much. You're a great friend, a great role model for everybody. And I appreciate you sharing your story and taking the time to come in today. Always a pleasure seeing you. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Who are you and what do you do? <laughs> That's been just right into right it. Right into it. Um, I mean, I am Matt, as you mentioned. And do you have a last name or are you like Cher? I, uh, yeah, I'm Cher. I'm Cher and Beyonce, <laughs> all, all of them in one, <laughs> if you couldn't tell. Matt Keenan and I guess the uh, comedian, that's the, the easiest way. Mm -hmm. That's I guess the only interesting part about you? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Um, and how long have you been a comedian? Ah, six and a half years now, I think. Okay. So. And what got you started in comedy? I mean, I think, I mean, I've always been interested in comedy. Like, it started, like, just even as a kid. Really? There was an interest. I remember when, when my parents first got a DVD player, my dad bought old, like, black and white. Folks, you'll have to Google what a DVD player yeah, is. Yeah, and black and white. Mm -hmm. You gotta Google that, too. Mm -hmm. um, like, old, like, Abbott and Costello and, like, Red Skeleton. And my mom liked the, the original Little, Ra Little Rascals. So it's kind of an introdu introduction to, like, comedy in general. Mm -hmm. How old would you have been? I don't know. I have no idea. When did DVD players come out? Yeah, when, probably we'll somewhere. Have to Google that too to figure yeah, it was behind the t we were behind the times on that too. There's an old tube TV with a, a DVD player <laughs> and that was kind of like, yeah, that was like an introduction to comedy for me. And then from there, I remember being in grade nine mm -hmm. in, I had biology class in the afternoon and after lunch we would do a reading period and I sat next to my friend Zach and he had his old iPod mm -hmm. and we'd both put an ear, earbud in and we'd watch stand-up specials. So like I, I watched like Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle and I think that was like the first hey, real yeah. like, of like stand-up, like, like modern day okay. stand-up and that was mm -hmm. kind of what really, I was like this is something I wanna try at some point. But I didn't know where or when or how so it was kind of just a pipe dream that I didn't think would ever actually come true, mm -hmm. unless I just happened to be somewhere. And, and then mm -hmm. James Mollinger really, once you started seeing his face and name everywhere, you're like, well, there's got to be something going on here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then started doing some digging around, and it kind of just went from there. So when you, um, how old were you when you did your first set? And talk me through that. I, how old was I? <laughs> age um 2016 okay. so i would have been 25 mm -hmm. and i the first that i did was for mark and dd Dee Dee, yes the comedy with balls later something funny mm -hmm. era of comedy mm -hmm. and i remember at that point i had probably been writing strictly like, with the intention of performing for almost a year. Wow, so you had tons of material that you never performed, but it was just stuff that was in your mind? I had written, yeah, so like, I kind of like, even like years before, like, I had started writing with the intention of, and then I just never did. But wait, was it, was it in your mind that it was going to be comedy, or were you thinking this could be a book, or a memoir? When I first... Wait, is a memoir if you're dead or alive? 
I think it doesn't matter. James was a memoir, wasn't it? Yes, okay. So he's, alive. he's still, as far yeah, as I know, yeah, okay. unless he's cloned or something. Yeah. Um, That's possible. That's so, a whole different yeah. When, when I first started writing, it was just like maybe, like, I didn't know enough about like how to properly write a joke. So it was okay. just like funny ideas. That's kind of where it started. And then once like I just. Like a diary? In some degree. It was in my notepad on my phone. Oh, wow. Okay. And I would just, it was just long. Yeah. And I would just like force people to listen to Siri read it out loud. That was right, right. psychopathic <laughs> so slightly. It was but a little yeah, bit, yeah. yeah but but you know, Kidding. we're all better off for it. Mm -hmm. So then, when I decided I want to actually do stand up, I kind of just started uh, writing. What do you mean by decided? So were when you I okay, when I made the decision that this is something that I want to try, okay. and I when I started seeing like James's face popping up in places, it was before he had done his first. Hyper station show TV right. station for people that yep. are yeah you have to two take years a drink, old a shot every um, time you say Harbor station I think is the yeah, yeah the new TV <laughs> but uh, so when I first like once I realized that there was something going on here and then my friend Drake Tobias yes his mom was she does like wedding mm -hmm. and stuff like that so yeah. she knew a lot of people yep. and I kind of just used those connections to find people to talk to sure and kind of get my foot into the door for the first open mic, I guess. So once I decided okay. that it was something I was going to try, I started actually writing, figuring out how to write, listening to podcasts, figuring out how to kind of craft just a basic setup punchline joke. Okay. And then... Is it hard? So you mean comedians that go on stage, you don't just walk out there and say something. So, I mean, you and do. This is, this is <laughs> other than Mandy. Yeah. That's just whatever the moment is. <laughs> so, but for folks that are watching right now, it, there's a whole craft to that, right? It, there's a lot of writing and talk, talk me yeah, through Yeah, I mean, huh? the, everybody's kind of different. There's so many, I think that a lot of people forget too with comedy is that there's so many different styles and genres. It's not, it's like music in that sense. Like, and a lot of people will like, they're very quick to be like, I don't like, you're not funny. And you're like, well, I, it's not that I'm not funny. It's just that you don't th like my comedy. It's the same thing. If you, style, like, right? if you like rap music right. and you go to a country show, right. it's not that they're not good. It's just not what you're into. Mm -hmm. So there's like, so for me, it's just kind of like, it's a lot of writing and timing is kind of where I think. Writing and timing. Those are like my biggest, great like, points. my, like, I think that that's probably one of my strongest just timing mm -hmm. in my performance. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody's different. So it's like, but there is a lot of work that goes into, and some people are just naturally skilled at it, mm -hmm. but there's for sure a lot of work that goes into doing it well. So say. your first show, so you decided, all right, I have my material. All right, I've watched podcasts, I've done research, writing, gone through all, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm ready, and you, you, you utilize your connections. I'm ready to go try an open mic. Talk me through that night, your feelings. Were you good on stage? Were you nervous? Did you? I was, I didn't eat the whole day because mm -hmm. there, was, there was definitely nerves that kind of set in the night before. So the it was like, okay. it was not the best sleep, mm -hmm. I didn't eat, and I think I wasn't as prepared as I thought I was, because mm -hmm. at that point I, I feel like I probably had a hundred jokes, and I was like, what do I do, like which ones, and now I'm like yeah. trying to figure so out which like, one I think I are cut? the best what ones, yeah. and then, so I just kind of, and then I wrote it all out like a script. Which was also a bad idea. Don't like memorize one? memorize the jokes. You don't have to remember the order, mm -hmm. but you should memorize your jokes. Mm -hmm. It's going to make things a lot easier. So then I kind of just went up, and I blanked, mm -hmm. and I remember just standing there like a deer in headlights, and I was <laughs> like, oh no, yeah. and I was so nervous, and I was just shaking. Yep. I'm holding the mic, and it's, and then so then I was like, I think I need to like, like I started my first joke and I couldn't remember it. So then I was like, I think I just need to pull out the paper. So I had it in my back pocket. I pulled it out, Smart. and I'm still shaking. So I can't even read yeah, yeah. what I have written. Yeah, like and then I, but I saw like, enough words to kind of get. To get you. And over then from yourself. there, I was like, okay, I can kind of. And then after you refer, had your stuff to refer to, did you find that you're like, oh, okay, this is. A, did you find once you the words? Once you kind of yeah, it kind of became like uh, I knew the jokes, but I was just like. How do I start? So how do I start? But I was just still like, just nervous in general. So it just yeah. makes you kind of like blank a little bit. But it was almost like, to me, like what, what I started doing after that was just having a few like bullet points, not the full joke yeah. word for word, so that I yeah, could glance and just see, like a track title. Yeah, perfect. Like a, it's just a set list. So 
that was the one, yeah, so that was kind of like my go-to afterwards, and then now I just don't care. Yeah, no, and that's, that's a good way to say it. You know, Matt, you reminded me of when I started Campus Radio in 2015, my very first show, so I went through all the prep, like you, I went through all of, yeah. you know, read all the books, what makes a great interview, how to interview, um, how to get inside the mind of your guests, like all the psychological yeah. stuff to interviewing, all of the videos and tutorials. So I, I said, all right, I have a lot of arsenal now, I'm ready to go do this. And my first two guests was David Ross and Tomato Tomato, and um, uh, David Ross was the very first one. He'd been a good friend of mine, and he'd said that he would be my first guest coming on. and. I had everything already. I'd been already trained on all the radio buttons, everything like that. And, um, and then it was the three, two, one, and the three, two, one. <laughs> then I hit it because we were going live because it's campus. And yeah. so I hit it and we're live. And then uh, I stared at him and I'm like, how do I start? I never thought about that. It doesn't say. And then I started thinking about them like, good morning. No, it's not morning because they're going to hear it in the afternoon. And then, no, they're not hearing it. This is live right now. This isn't one of those. This is. And then, like, all the thoughts in my head. Yeah. And then, so it would the deer in the headlights. I stood there and then he said, well, I'm going to start off by introducing myself. <laughs> I'm, you know, blah, 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 blah. And always starting out at something new. And I remember, I think, um, uh, even with this show, when, on our first episode on this show, starting off, I um, never know how to start. So I remember trying to, um, I'm like, do I go three, two, one? Do I do this? Do I do that? Not this specific episode today, but on our first episode, I think on our first season. And I had on um, Derek, James, and Nikki. And... Um, they're all comedians, anybody that's watching. And um, I didn't, I wasn't starting it right. I think that, and we saved those. Like I did my intro, I count backwards the other way. And then Nikki just stole the show where she just said, well, I'm taking over. And she did that. But <laughs> it, both of those are kind of my examples of, and it's funny yeah. you said that because when I talk to a lot of people, they say that similarly to what you and I've encountered is it's the starting of something new. And yeah. It's the starting of something new. So the hardest part of the going to the gym for the first time is going to the goddamn gym. The hardest part about starting anything new is to start it. Once you start it, you find that you know yeah, yeah. It, it feels natural or another sense comes of it. Yeah, so and you know, sometimes you're just reading into it too much. And, and we it, do, and don't it just we? throws you off. Yeah. But once you, yeah, once once you you're realize out of it's your actually head, no, right? it's not that bad. You get into your head. Yeah. Which, uh, and so you did that show. and. How did you feel after the show? Were you were you? Like I got laughs, so I knew that there was something there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was enough to be like, okay, I want to continue mm -hmm. with this. It was like you you got hungry for more. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, like I think, I think if I had a completely bought, like I I don't know, I don't think that I did amazing. Mm -hmm. But it was like enough that I was that I knew that I, like I could get good at it. Yeah, could you could do craft it. it. You could craft so it. So I think skill. that was like if I had it done terribly the first time, I don't know if I would have wanted to try it again. But just getting a laugh was enough. Like that adrenaline rush and that feeling was like enough to want to continue. How many folks were there roughly, right? Maybe fifty. That's a good amount for your first yeah. time. That yeah. That'd be. That'd be a there bit might not even have been like it was. <laughs> like, like, that, you're on, <laughs> when you're on stage, I mean, you know what yeah. it's like. When you're yeah. on stage, the lights are so bright sometimes you can't even see. You don't even have you're, like, yeah. you're like, I can see the yeah. three people in front of me, and that's yeah. it. And yeah, and then that's what goes with it. Yeah, it's. Uh, I remember. I think it was back. Uh, I think my third or fourth show, and I had. I was doing something. I did that with the microphone, and I snapped it over my yeah. inner thigh, and then I was like, uh oh. And that's how I learned the art of improv. And I was like, they don't make them like they used to, and everyone laughed and the more I talked the more like yeah. it felt like the microphone literally just disintegrated eventually <laughs> and then I was like all right well thank god I'm a loud talker and then and you find that because and I know that you can speak to your testament to that is the best part about comedy or performing or being on stage or doing anything like that is the unknown like you get oh yeah absolutely hungry for that like the, if the audience is going to yeah. feed you something great that you're able to run with in one of your skits or you're going to go at a specific venue and, you know, something falls apart or doesn't work out, but that's yeah. the whole experience, right? There's a lot of, yeah. Like, I, I always say, like, I enjoy bombing, too. Why? So, why? Because I just think that you learn more mm -hmm. from that than you do from having a good... So many people are like, if they do well, then they're just living in that moment mm -hmm. and they're not trying to think of how to improve. Mm -hmm. So, like, going out and doing bad, you're like, what could I have done better? Could I have, you know, made notes? So could I think I it's have, easier yeah. to like, because I always record the audio 
yeah. at the very least How of come? all my sets so that I can listen back, especially like if I'm working on something different or if something didn't go well. Even if something did go well, sometimes you're just enjoying that moment and you listen back like, ooh, this, it went, it didn't go as good as I thought it went. Like maybe I'm just. If you're having a bad day and you go on stage, does that, are you out of the moment of the bad day and on stage? Are you able to detach yourself? I've, from yeah, I've gotten a lot life? better at that, but sometimes I will just not, like I'll take a break if I need to mm -hmm. kind of, if I need to just focus on whatever's kind of going on. In life. In life. But like I can still, like I'm still usually pretty good. Like I'm just like, it's, it, if it, it's, it's different than like working like an eight hour shift. Right. You know, you're like, okay, I just have to be, block out everything that's going on for whatever, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, right. whatever the, sure. the length of your, yeah. your set is. So it's not too, too bad, I find, but. What is the most challenging thing about performing, in your personal opinion? I don't, I don't even know. That's like a, like, I don't know what I would consider. To me, like, I, hosting, I think that for me is mm -hmm. the, like, and I'm, I'm comfortable enough now to go off script when I need to go off script, but I hate, like, I always feel like hosting is, that's what it is. You, you're, yeah. you're interacting with the crowd, you're kind of just, you're being that person that's kind of like, right? you're setting the your tone, you're warming people up. And so like, that's what kind of throws me off, is like, intentionally doing that, it, it's, it kind of takes me, I'm, I'm, I'm more focused on, on like, or somebody mentioned uh, last week at that showcase that I didn't see him myself, and I think it was because I had lost my voice that day. And I was just going, I was like, I am so focused on just holding the sure microphone as close as I can and talking as loudly as I can that I'm not thinking about anything else. So it's just, I wasn't yeah. off, but I was just. Your shirt I was, was really loud focused that day. Yeah, my that <laughs> couldn't speak over yeah, your yeah. loud shirt. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on with the shirt. Yeah, but, but no, it's perception, right? Like that's yeah. What, yeah, exactly. It, Oh, that makes sense. Tell me a time that you've been starstruck. So I know that you've done traveling with comedy. You've been very successful, winning awards, doing many yeah. shows. Um, who, what comedian have you met that you've been that you've been starstruck? Other than me. Other than you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very humbly. And I was in Vancouver. Okay. How long was this, Matt? Uh, 2018, okay. 19, 19. Because mm -hmm. I moved to Toronto in 2018, so it was June. Thank of, God you didn't burn all 20. your bridges, eh? Yeah, like, bye, yeah. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> so no, but that. you went to go explore and do something incredibly awesome. To yeah. Go do, like, it's amazing. So Absolutely. Talk, yeah, talk so, yeah, it. I was in, I was performing at Yuck Yucks in Vancouver. Wow. And Ray Romano was in town filming a TV show. Uh -huh. So he popped in to do a spot. And he introduced himself. And he was just so down to earth. So and I was just like. Him. Were you a Ray Romano fan, Matt? I like the show, yeah. I, I, I don't. Did you love Raymond? Everybody loves okay, it. Okay. That's, that's so but dumb. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. Um, so he, no, he was fil he was filming a show and he just went into work on on some new material. But I remember I was. Did you know he was coming or he just? So we knew that somebody was coming, but we didn't know who. So that they had kind of like Lauren, who was the club manager at the time, she had the like the list of like the comedians of who was yeah. doing guest spots. Yeah. Like, and in the order. Yeah, so I was list. doing like a split middle at that point with Alana Brittany, who's a comedian okay. from uh, Vancouver. And so I'd done the Friday night and she went first and then I went second. Mm -hmm. And then on the Saturday night we swapped, so I was going first. So yeah. I knew that there was two, like Damon Stritter, who had just headlined yeah. Yeah. Uh, at punch Punchlines. Lines, he was a guest spot. And I was like, well, if he's a guest spot and they're naming him, then some, if there's an, a secret guest that's going up after the middle acts, before the headliner, it has to be someone that they can, that they think is, is, is bigger than a Canadian headliner like, yeah. like Damon. So yeah, sure. uh, we knew it was somebody, but we couldn't find out who. And then Ian Black, who's a comedian out of Halifax, he had knew Lauren because she used to run the Halifax Club. Oh, wow. So he was able to poke and prod until she yeah, finally yeah. said, tell me, tell me, tell oh, me, tell I, me, I think, tell I think, me. I think, I think Ray Romano's coming. <laughs> And then, uh, so then short enough, we're just like sitting, they propped open the back door because he was gonna come into the back alley, not even through the front door, just super surprised. And then you just see this like black, like escalated roll up. Uh. I'm like, I think that's him. And then I have to go up on stage. So I'm just on stage and I walk him, I like, watch him walk in the back door and I'm like, oh, 
I Your feel IBS did not I need to. I was not diagnosed then, so we were good. Okay. Um, so I was just like focusing I'm glad on I my let set. Everybody know. Yeah, just <laughs> focusing on my set. I was like, I can't, I can't get distracted with yeah. him being back and there. And how do you, how do you compose yourself? I mean, nobody else knew he was there, which makes it a little bit easier. Like you were like, there's only like five people that know he's here right now. So like, I'm not like as long as I can just focus on what I'm doing. So does this mean you can say open for Ray Romano? I mean, in a sense, because yeah. I didn't go before him. Yeah. It was yeah. not, I was not yeah. asked, but. Yeah, you got the crowd warmed up for him. But, uh, yeah, but we'll, we can go with that. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, yeah, he was like, like literally, he, I got off stage, I went back to the green room, and he just like stuck his hand out, shook my hand, he's like, hey, I'm Ray. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, you don't have to introduce yourself. And then he just said. Did you smell him? Yeah, of course. Okay. Absolutely. I took a picture with yeah. him. I, I was like, put your arm mm -hmm. around my, my shoulder so mm -hmm. I can give a little. What's a famous person's armpit smell like? Yeah, that's uh, the name of yeah. your memoir <laughs> <laughs> yeah. coming up. So you had so you had that opportunity, and I think we have just about two minutes left now. Yeah. But for anybody that is thinking about trying something, and um, I feel like you're saying, go try it and bomb. Go try it and figure it <laughs> out. No, because I think that the, there's a lot to be said in that. Like there's such a there's a lot to be said in. Any person that I've had the opportunity to talk to or interview has, that's always been the message consistently across where they've said, we've done our best when we've been uncomfortable, when we've yeah. been outside of our element, yeah. right? Absolutely. It's easy to do what we know every day, yeah. but it's boring. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, 100%. And so anybody that's thinking about trying something, what do you have to say to them? What's your message to them? What's I your just say like, it's, it's not always going to be good. You're not always mm -hmm. going to in, enjoy the feeling, but you will learn from it, and the good feelings will just improve if you if you take the good with the bad. Because if you just if you get to that comfortable feeling and that's all you want, eventually it's going to get stale. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to take those risks and fail, and then it makes you know these successful ones feel that much like you feel that much better. Absolutely. And if anyone wants to book you for anything, we have about 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Um, yeah, find me on Instagram. It's the Matt Keenan, or there's a, I have a website, mattkeenancomedy.com. You can find me on social media. Just search me. But find the real me because somebody hacked my old account, so don't talk to them. Okay, perfect. I want to thank you so much, Matt, oh, for coming in today. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody that's watching right now. We were joined with Eric, who delivered his amazing story of everything he's going through. And Matt, so 